I decided to tell you more about um, optical lamps in optical lamps. So, so uh, as you see, we have a lot uh, uh, of topics to cover here. So uh, let's uh, jump right in. So um, uh, I wanted to start with showing you one movie that I hadn't been able to show last time. So these are individual atoms in the quantum gas microscope that they pop up and down. You can also see particularly well on the, on the video screen, actually. <laughs> Um, so um, it's just nice. We were, we were quite excited, uh, like when we were able to, to, to do this. Remember, like the the resolution is quite good. The lattice spacing is half a micron. So this is at the edge where we can optically resolve at those wavelengths. And now we have these atoms um, hopping in the um, um, in the lattice as they are laser cooled with molasses. But um, this, of course, is not the actual physics we study, because here we constantly observe the atoms, so this is not really a quantum uh, mechanical model. Uh, so uh, what we do, of course, is we, prefer, we first do our quantum mechanics, and then we take um, a single snapshot. Uh, I just wanted to show you that. Right, right, and switch off all the time away. Whereas what's happening there is in response to the illumination of the atoms. Right, so what happens here is that the lattice depth isn't, isn't quite deep enough to totally prevent tunneling in higher bands. So the atoms are now populated in higher bands, higher vibrational states on the lattice side, and the lattice depth isn't quite deep enough to uh, avoid tunneling, to avoid that atoms hop from one. Well, so they're doing that in the response other. to the illumination you're providing? So um, the illumination we provide cools them, but you can think about it a little bit as like a quasi-thermal bath, kind of. So they, they keep the atoms uh, on, on a certain average energy, typically. And as uh, yeah. they always go up and down the, um, the, the, um, the, the, um, the vibrational states that they let aside, and if they get to higher bands, then they have a finite probability of tunneling. What's also interesting, of course, is uh, it would be possible to study that quantum Zeno effect. So essentially, by observing an atom, you, you, uh, you do not allow it to tunnel and things like that. Uh, but you would have to change the system a little bit to really do this in a meaningful way. Uh, yeah. Okay, so but what we normally do is uh, we study physics like the superfluid to mod transition, then we switch off all the tunneling and we take one single picture. <coughs> And just to remind you, so <clears throat> the superfluid tomorrow transition was uh, in the superfluid, each atom is delocalized over the entire lattice. And if you look locally on the lattice side, then we have a coherent superposition of different um, atom numbers on the side, um, which is a coherent state, uh, classical state, or Kirchhoff state here. Uh, and um, so uh, they have a well defined phase. So if you do metabate interference, we see these interference uh, pictures, but you can easily see that as the increase interaction, you get more and more numbers squeezing, ultimately ending up with a number state. So the could be the other side. Uh, and uh, uh, this is called a mod insulator. Uh, um, yeah, um, uh, this is called uh, a mod insulator. Um, state and the atoms can now move around with one atom everywhere uh, in the first uh, approximation we associate this with the number state. But we'll actually see in a little while that there are a bit more interesting uh, things going on if you also consider correlations. Okay, so and it, again, you can image this here, this is the superfluid we find. Um, uh, um, remember when we image, we actually measure parity. So here it's about as likely to have all an even population, but if you increase the interaction, then you get this quantum phase transition to a modern insulator, but we have one atom side exactly, and this shows up as a, as a modern insulator here. Big enough to time of flight where we measure the uh, matter wave in a few weeks And I showed you this too, but let me show you this again because we'll see later pictures again. In our in our <coughs> Uh, system as we add more and more atom, the atoms actually, actually develop a shell structure of quantum insulator shells with superfluid shells in between. So this is, for example, uh, there are no atoms here, one atom per lattice side, two, three, four atoms per lattice side, 
in uh, in the shells file. So you need those to go through the shells. This forms in the ability if you just start with more atoms in the same uh, quantity uh, compound. Um, let me next address the question about non-equilibrium dynamics. What is really nice in our um, ultra cold atom system is that the time scales are very accessible, meaning that the typical energy scales correspond to uh, frequencies in the kilohertz range. And that means we can adiabatic or we can change parameters and see how the system responds in time. This is very different from what we can do in condensed matter physics. In condensed matter physics, it's very hard to do that because energy scales are often terahertz. So uh, that there were recently some experiments like pulse probe kind of experiments with 10 per second laser uh, um, where you can start to, um, to investigate dynamics, but it's very hard. And so it turns out, even in theoretical condensed matter physics, there is no real framework for non-equilibrium <coughs> dynamics. People don't really know how to think or talk about non-equilibrium physics. And this is a great opportunity because there seem to be a lot of really exciting things going on. Just to give you an example for classical systems, for example, it is known that very often you can think of, uh, if you want to understand non-equilibrium dynamics of nonlinear systems, solitons, for example, is a great way to think about it. You find these phenomena happen in all kinds of contexts, like these big free waves or, um, or light and optical fiber, or like you, you find kind of, you have the language and the framework to, uh, to talk about it. Um, and the same in, uh, in equilibrium systems, it's very well understood you have polypersonality uh, <laughs> classes. Uh, if you understand a certain kind of quantum phase transition or, or phase tr uh, transition in general, then you get inside of a whole class of of uh, traditions, if you just know the nature of the order parameters and things like that, so that's that's very clear framework. For net, uh, and this is pretty much non-existent for non-equilibrium physics, and so I think this is a great opportunity. Uh, and one of the major reasons is that experimentally, what it just wasn't possible to study the dynamics of complex many-body quantum systems. Let me show you a few examples how we now start to approach this uh, non-equilibrium physics with uh, with ultra cold atoms. Um, so one experiment we did recently is ask the question, okay, I showed you quantum phase transition goes, goes from a superfluid uh, that has a coherent state with a Poissonian number distribution, so the superposition of all these, uh, of, of no atom, one atom, two atom, three atoms per lattice side, and then you do a quantum phase transition to a mod state. In this case, this is a mod state that's not very deep in the mod regime, so it's got some finite fluctuation, but nearly all the population You have one atom in nearly each of the lattice cells. The question is, how quickly can you do that? What are our energy scales? Um, the tunneling time. How long does it take to tunnel? Or actually, this this like h over j would be the time for a Rabi uh, period. How long does it take for an atom to do a Rabi oscillation back and forth to a neighboring lattice cell? Okay. Um, in our uh, like, for this experimental parameters at the critical point 70 milliseconds. Then we have um, the interaction energy, like what kind of uh, frequency does the interaction energy correspond to? Uh, so these are the energy scales. Now I'm asking how quickly can we go from the superfluid to a mod state? Remember, superfluid with Poissonian atom number distribution everywhere. There was no order whatsoever. Um, and um, let's do it. A similar classical problem. Let's imagine you have a room with 100 chairs and you have 100 people in the room that are uh, totally unordered. How long does it take until every person finds one chair? There are no empty chairs and no people without a chair. How many tunneling times? How many times from one chair to the next would that take, roughly? And, yeah. What do you think? That was the answer, but it would take long. Right? This would take really, really long. The amazing thing is, if you do this with the superfluid to mod transition, superfluid, each atom is everywhere, can be delocalized. Uh, well, of course, they're indistinguishable, that's very important. But you have Poissonian statistics on each letter side. 
we find that we can get from that state to this state within a fraction of the time of time. It's actually you, the, so the, the time constant we measure here, the one over e time, is 3 milliseconds. Of course, you can argue what, what's the relevant thing, but if I just take the one over e time here, uh, 3 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. So if you label each atom so that you can answer the question, how far did each atom have to move to mm -hmm. go from the beginning, to, to from, the, from, from, the, from the superfluid state to the the uh, plus state, what's the answer to that question? I mean, the thing is, once you label them, you can have superfluid. So, well, I, I it's really important that it's having the superfluid. <laughs> right. And uh, if you ask me, okay, how far does that atom have to go? Well, I think it really has to go at most one side. Kind of. Well, I, except, except it has to coordinate with the other ones, right? Sure. <laughs> because it can't, they can't all go to the same side. Uh, um, so they're indistinguishable, so it's not that if, if one atom is delocalized over everything in the beginning, it doesn't mean that it has to go all to, the way to the other corner, because they're indistinguishable. It's just in the end, the atom number has to be right. Okay. So for a single atom, in order to fix this distribution, I'd say, typically, you, you need to go at most one side, and on average, you have to go less than that. That's why a time like that is possible at all, if the time like time is actually that large. Does this time depend on the size of your lattice? So not the, not as a one over e time, but I agree that this one over e time is a little bit misleading. If you have, if you ask how long does it take until all of the atoms, like until of a lattice in the size uh, with, with n lattice size, until all the atoms have found their spot, or until I have no defect anymore, and that's a, that would certainly expect to depend on the time. So I think there are actually two slopes here. One that we haven't really looked, the second one we haven't really looked into yet. Uh, we have some preliminary data that I don't have here that, that we can now get to 99% to death. So sorry, I should actually tell what it's probably. So this is the, the probability of finding odd population. We start with some state close to Poissonian number statistics, so there are strong fluctuations. And then as you go to the mod state, if you start with the n equal 1 mod insulator, you go towards uh, the probability for having odd of one, as I'm talking here, um, if you have one atom everywhere, or if you have two, this is two atoms, if you have two atoms everywhere, then you go towards zero. Uh, here we had defect density of about 5% because of the limited finite temperature. Right now we can go up to 1% even. And so we want to revisit this and look into those time scales. So there's an interesting time scale. Uh, yeah, that certainly has to frame this a little bit more careful the question, what do you mean by how long does it take? Good point. But, um, I mean, yeah, just, um, just in general, uh, so um, um, I found that quite surprising, like the time in time is about 70 milliseconds, but much faster than that you already get uh, to, uh, uh, to a pretty good modern solution. And this is certainly very non-classical, like if you, you do require a superfluid to start with, essentially. You could not do this with just a thermal gas of uh, fantastic. Okay, so these kind of questions will be very interesting in the future, and of course also important for quantum simulation, because typically you want to start with some kind of ground state in one system, and then you want to tune your parameters to get to the ground state in a different system, Oh, and for that you need to be adiabatic, so even if you want to study ground state systems, um, non-equilibrium is important to understand, but non-equilibrium is also very interesting by itself. There's another recent experiment by Emmanuel Bloch, uh, um, which, uh, which is the second group um, that uh, had built a quantum glass microscope now. Uh, what they have looked into is, if, um, um, let's say, uh, you have some perturbation, how does this spread, this information about perturbation, how does this um, spread? And so what they did was they made uh, a quench of the system, meaning that they, they, um, they went from, a, from a, uh, pretty much from a superfluid into a different lattice depth, where uh, that wasn't the ground state anymore, and then looked for correlations in the, um, uh, looked for correlations in the ground state. Uh, uh, in the ground state, meaning that 
but this is to understand the spin up. If, if there is a spin, uh, if you imagine you calculate the spin spin correlations here. So if this spin has tilted after a certain time, where else have the spins tilted? Like, uh, and there can only be a correlation between this tilted spin and this tilted spin, is the basic idea. If this information about this spin having tilted has propagated out to this uh, point. And so they call it like um, light cone dynamics, essentially. There is a certain time it takes for this information to travel to here. And surprisingly, they actually really find these correlations very nicely. So this is a correlation function uh, for different times here. And here they plot the correlation of uh, the, uh, the, the, the fluctuation that we put um, original side uh, over, um, uh, over, over uh, uh, like at the next, uh, at the side, at the, um, at the second next, at the third next, fourth next, fifth next, sixth uh, next, at the side. And it, whenever you see here a signal that means that there is a correlation present, they see that the further they go away, it takes a finite time until these correlations appear. And so it's kind of like a light cone dynamics in the system, uh, but they're now looking into it more carefully, and there seem to be some non-trivial um, uh, effects going on, actually. So I don't have time to, to go into detail, but just as, a, as another idea, the kind of things you can do if you combine these local microscopic studies with non-equilibrium, you have a lot of, uh, of possibilities. The other thing is that, um, <coughs> that in modern condensed matter physics, you are often interested uh, in systems that are not easily described by um, a simple order parameter. So traditionally, uh, states like superfluid or magnets are described by a simple order parameter. Okay? Meaning that you have something quasi-classical showing up that uh, um, uh, that develops some long range order. For example, in a superfluid, you have this macroscopic phase showing up that develops long range order. In a magnet, you have spin orientation showing up that develops long range order. Maybe ferromagnetic, antiferromagnetic, whatever. It's some long range order of something pretty classic, of something uh, uh, classical, of uh, like oriented spins, for example, or, or superfluid. Or, of course, in the BCS uh, case, it's the BCS wave function. So. But these are all simple. For, 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 um, yeah. so, um, but beyond that, uh, people are particularly interested now in a more exotic states of matter, which really haven't, which have hardly been studied experimentally, uh, or there's no direct um, um, evidence for them, but, but theorists find that. They pop up everywhere. They're all kind of interesting states of matter uh, that have very intriguing, interesting properties. So examples are spin liquids, for example. In spin liquids, uh, you have a frustrated spin system. And what experimenters find is that if they cool their spin system to very low temperatures, much lower uh, 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 to temperatures than naively you would expect spin ordering, the spins don't order. They, they don't find order. And so theorists then came up, hmm, why could that be? And they came up with these spin liquids. Unfortunately, experimentally, it's, um, there, there is no direct evidence of, uh, well, there, there are lots of, uh, there's, there's lots of indirect evidence, like you cool and you don't find it, and then you can measure, uh, uh, you can do other tests, but it's more like, uh, like you don't really see, so the characteristic thing of these states is, um, correlation, non-trivial correlations um, that show up and they are not described by a uh, simple order program. Um, other examples would be uh, quantum Hall effects. Or, like the evidence, like these plateaus and so on, and non-fractional um, numbers. This is all quite indirect. What you really want, want to measure is local correlation function. And the beauty is that uh, and the beauty is that uh, well, like um, um, non factorizable correlations, essentially. Uh, and in this system, you really have entanglement present. Like it's, it's, um, an entanglement is what gives rise to these exotic states um, of matter, like these are true, for example. 
Um, what is nice is that our convex microscope, in principle, we can do, uh, we can extract all kind of correlations. We could even do state tomography, uh, and this is nice, which means that like once we can create exotic states of matter, we can really measure the kind of, cor uh, of correlations that characterize these exotic states of matter, which is just not possible in uh, matter physics, where you, uh, where you normally uh, probe macroscopic observables and so on that are not directly linked to this kind of entanglement and correlations. Let me show you a few examples. So we don't have these strong, uh, these exotic states of matters produced yet. I'm very optimistic that we will be able to produce these at other models. But let me show you how we can use the quantum gas microscope to extract correlation functions. Simple example is again a modern insulator. What happens in a modern insulator? Well, naively you have one atom everywhere, but that's not the full story. There can, um, two things can happen. You can have thermal excitations. What do you think what a thermal excitation will cause? How will, uh, how will this look here? Thermal excitation in the atomic one insulator, meaning the, the far limit where the interaction is dominant. How will this look? Any idea? Uh, what happens if you have a thermal excitation? Would you lose some atoms? Right, like one atom might, might move, and, but then it might just move away, and if you take a picture, you you see uh, like a hole, for example. Like here, an atom has gone away. It's just one missing. Like that's what gives you entropy in a deep model insulator. Or you could have two somewhere, and the other one hops around. So these are thermal excitations. Okay. But then we also have coherent excitations because constantly uh, the atoms are pro. They're constantly virtually hopping to the neighboring lattice sites. Unless you have infinite lattice steps, you have a finite uh, probability to find the atom on the neighboring side. So one way to think of this is that, okay, this atom would want to hop to the neighboring side. So it will hop over there, but quickly find that, oh, wait a minute, here, uh, uh, there is an atom already, I have to hop back right away. So this is a T square, if, if you call the time in T, a T square over U process, a second order process, uh, where the atom probes uh, whether it can move or not. It hops here virtually, finds, okay, this is the wrong energy, I have to go back. Okay. So, 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 uh, uh, we have these processes all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when you draw the potential for the optical values, do you ever get uh, defects in the potential? The what? The do you ever get defects in the potential, or is the sinusoidal assumption? Um, the sinusoidal is very good. Do you have uh, what we have currently, and what we are working on to totally get rid of, is very slow potential modulation, like slow disorder. But we don't have disorder on a short length scale. But we must be careful to not have that. So, if this is happening here, if we take a picture while the atom is here, or if you project the atom numbers and take into account the finite probability that the atom might be on the wrong side, then we have suddenly two and zero next to each other. And um, this would be a double and whole pair, and the probability of this is on order of j squared over u. So the deeper we go, the less likely, but if you don't go to a very deep model, this is significant. And so we can probe this directly, okay? What, uh, is, what is the lifetime of this, of this excitation? Do you, do, you know, do you know the lifetime? Um, like, uh, life, I mean, yeah, it's, so much much time it's it imaginary. Uh, how much time does it take typically to, to jump back? Right? It's given by the detuning, de right? I mean, right. If, you, yeah. if you go to a, to a detuned state, it's, it's given by the detuning U, essentially, yeah. Right. Like, like if you go to a, a, a forbidden state, yeah. You. But, but for the type of lattices you have, is it, it must be extremely fast, right? So U is, 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 is on order of a few hundred hertz. Right, so, so, that's, yes. so that's the time scale. So right. right, so the time scale is faster than other time scales in the system, right. yes. Mm -hmm. So given your request that the only measure parity, how do you distinguish like, this process? So currently the only measure parity, actually right now the students in the lab are actually uh, implementing a real counting scheme, but, but not using them yet. So if you just do parity, well, what would you find? You would find two empty sides that next to each other. And thermally, that's just really unlikely. And thermally, that's just really unlikely. Because thermally, holes would be 
independent of each other. Whereas here, you would find two empty sets next to each other. So um, let's see if you find this. And this is a plot if we calculate uh, the, 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 the nearest neighbor correlation uh, for including lattice depth, then the mod transition is kind of here, then we find that as we go deeper, deeper into the mod state, it gets much more likely to have these. And the kind of defects you find are very likely correlated, like by a factor of four times more likely, we find two uh, together. Uh, recently, uh, uh, like we, we did this a while ago, but we had some, uh, did a focus on other things. This actually was. Um, something very similar, or pretty much the same thing was published recently by the block group. So here you see the, the models that are one D models that you choose, which was a nice idea, because for one D you have stronger fluctuations in the model spacer, so it's easier to observe this, it was very nice, clever idea. And here you can see it in the picture directly, let's say you have two empty sides, you have two empty sides, two empty sides, two empty sides, and this is the vitalized picture. They okay. even went beyond that, uh, um, saying that you can define this as a measurement of the so-called string order. I don't want to go into detail here, but this is the kind of string order is one example of the interesting order parameters that you cannot measure in uh, traditional condensed matter physics because you have to measure each individual spin and from that you can deduce that order parameter. Uh, in the case of the mod insulator, uh, string order exists but isn't a particularly interesting property. The property is linked to the fact that these, these virtual excitations, they could even hop uh, further. But it's very unlikely, but they can. So in principle, the string order parameter can tell you about uh, those kind of, um, of, of properties. <coughs> yeah, OK. But so we can measure. You can measure these kind of things. And in general, we could do even much more. If you have a spin system, you can really measure the spins locally. So you, you can measure a spin-spin correlation function. Um, uh, but uh, you could do more, because you could actually do a quantum operation before you measure. Meaning that normally, uh, the, the, or if you measure the density, you could measure a density-density correlation function. You spin, uh, uh, you measure spin-spin. But what we could also do is we could for example, with spin-dependent transport, and bring a spin up together with a with a spin down, um, which is a wave over a certain distance, and so you could calculate uh, operators like s um, um, s x i. You can look at my relations so s x i s y j, where i and j is pretty far away. You can bring them together and uh, do a pi over two pulse, and then measure. Um, and then measure the spin projection. So, but that means that you could do real state tomography. And these are certainly things we are interested in in the future to do state tomography of many body systems, really measure the entanglement, measure the correlation in these kind of systems. So this seems very feasible because of our high fidelity detection. Uh, are there any questions on that? Good. Then, um, next I would like to give you another example of the kind of tools we have in our system and what we can do with that. Another example is uh, what we have recently realized is an orbital excitation, which is kind of reminiscent of a replicate, except it's a bit more local, but it's the same kind of idea that, uh, yeah, as you will see. So what we can do, this is our 2D lattice in uh, the trap. Uh, in the vertical direction, we now have something that is close to a harmonic oscillator, but not quite. It's actually a little bit unharmonic, uh, but there's no time link going on in the virtual direction unless we wanted to. And so we can use an excitation in this vertical uh, confinement. We can use that excitation as a new degree of freedom. You could even encode it. A spin in that degree of freedom or so. So we can, uh, in the vertical, Direction, let's say, here for example, uh, we explain this notation. So here we have one atom in the ground vibrational state in the vertical direction and a zero atom in the excited. And here we have zero in the ground and one in the, in the excited. We can drive transitions between these here by uh, um, coupling them 
who essentially so, uh, um, so shake it. If you, if you have a harmonic oscillator, um, how do you, um, if you start at the zeros, uh, uh, if you start in the ground state, how can you bring it into the first excited state, for example, what we have to do, or uh, as soon as a non-harmonic oscillator? What would you have to do to excite the, um, up the ladder one? Um, sh sure, but let's let's do let's think a bit more simply. If you just have a okay, uh, if you have a ball and a parabola, so how do you make shape? The two ways basically. Right, so one is move the lats, meaning in this case, uh, if you move your ball back and forth, it, goes, it, will, uh, it will start swinging, right? And, and that's what we can do if you would shape the lattice, then we would go from an, from an even to an odd uh, excitation. What, do you want to, what would you do if you want to go from an even to an even uh, excitation? What's the other way? What do you do on a swing? Change frequency. Right, like parametric oscillation. And that would mean you modulate your depth. No? But um, right. so you would, you would modulate uh, uh, your depth at twice the frequency, and then you can do a, a transition to say that. And that's exactly what we do here. So here we modulate our depth, and I haven't shown the immediate state here, but we can go then up. Uh, if we modulate it at the right frequency, we can, we can drive this. Oscillation. If you have a harmonic oscillator, you would just go up the ladder, but since we, we, we're non harmonic enough, so that there is no state at twice the frequency. So we can consider this as a spin half. You can really do Rabi oscillations between them. I will actually show you in a second. What happens if you have two atoms now? If you have two atoms and there's interaction between the two atoms, but it turns out that the uh, strength of the interaction depends on the overlap of the wave function. And if you place one of the atoms into a higher vibrational state, the wave function will have a different shape, and hence it has a different overlap. And hence the, um, the, uh, the interaction strength will be different. So this is the interaction, the repulsion of the two atoms if they're both in the ground state. This is the repulsion if one of them is in the excited state. And this is the repulsion if they're both in the excited state. And these three numbers are different. This is nice now because this means you cannot only drive a Rabi transition here if one of them is in the ground state and the other one is in the excited state. You can also do it here and selectively bring one atom into the excited state. Okay? And um, this is called object excitation block. So again, two things change whether we have one or two atoms. First of all, the absolute frequency that we need changes so we can address these processes independently, whether we have one or two. So this, this frequency is different from this one. But also, if we drive it at this one, we will get a Rabi oscillation between these two situations. We will never have the second one up here. What do we have to do if we also want to bring this second atom up? Same thing with the Right. We just have to add this one here. So we, we could first do this and then this, or there are different possibilities to, to drive this as a second order uh, process essentially and bring both atoms up. And in this case, we, we would actually uh, we could even, uh, create a bell state. The two atoms up plus two atoms down. So this highly non-trivial, you can't do things like this with photons usually because it's just not, um, you don't have the strong interaction, which is much stronger than your, uh, your rather rate here. Or so. This is really nice with atoms that we have a clear separation of energy field to be able to play with these uh, kind of things. So let me show you an example. This is a mod insulator one, uh, with one atom per side here, odd, so it's bright. Two atoms per side here, even, so it's dark. Okay. In our scale of frequency, we find that in, in the, um, uh, with one atom per side, uh, we, we always measure odd population, so the odd is one, odd population, odd population. And at this frequency, we then see that we can transfer atoms into uh, um, sorry, what we do before imaging is that we remove the atoms from the higher band. So then they show up as, uh, as odd here, meaning that we have no band in the, in the ground. They don't have any ground state. We start with two atoms, then we start with even, even, even. And at a different frequency now, uh, we can 
uh, make a, a transition here where we put one of the two atoms into the higher band. If you now sit on these frequencies, let's first sit on this frequency here, and you see we, see, we get a nice Rabi oscillation here. Uh, so here, all the, uh, like all the bright spots here, which, pop, uh, which show that we have an odd population in the lowest vibrational state, they all disappear. Okay? But they come back again and disappear again. So we get a very clean Rabi oscillation here. The center, we don't touch. Um, nothing is happening in the center, it just stays off. So here we now have uh, zero atoms in the... So what this means is that we address now the transition, we only touch lattice sites that have one atom per side and do a Rabi oscillation into the higher band. If you look at the center where we have two atoms, if you change the frequency, then we only do a Rabi oscillation if we have two atoms per side. But it's a clean Rabi oscillation, meaning that we always only put one atom into the higher band. One interesting thing is this happens to be if you measure it within three digits, this is exactly a square root of two faster than this. Any idea why this might be a square root of two faster than this? You have two atoms, and you now excite one to the higher band. Why could this be a square root of two faster? Hmm? Um, well, it's still two atoms of the same mass, but. Uh, um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a quantum effect. So both both enhancements. Hmm, both enhancements. Well, that's essentially like both enhancement because both atoms, they are indistinguishable, but they both have the chance to go up. So the amplitudes add up essentially, and so if you do the calculation here, you find you get a factor square to higher rate in this case. Do you also get factors of uh, square root of n from all the atoms? Not all the atoms, no, because we, we do this experiment is separately on all the other sites. They don't talk to others. They don't know about the others. This one. Because here we only consider what's happening on the side. But this is similar to Rydberg blockade. In the Rydberg blockade, you have the same thing happening. You try to excite many atoms into the Rydberg state, but only one of them will end up going uh, because the, the presence of this and besides they will block it for all other atoms, but you get the same uh, square root and um, enhancement there. With Rydberg, it's over a long distance because this the electric uh, fields uh, act over long distance. In our case, it acts with inner lattice site. But otherwise, it's, it's kind of a similar blocking attack. Okay, so we can do these things. The nice thing is this could be used for quantum gate. The fidelities are quite good, so one could really start thinking about whether these vibrational uh, excitations might actually be a decent kind of like qubit. Or one could combine this with the spin degrees of freedom. Uh, it builds spin degrees of freedom. We, we use this actually uh, uh, just to play a little bit. Uh, it turns out there's a whole cascade kind of a different vibrational frequency. This process happens with different atom numbers. If you have like 4 per side, 3 per side, 2 per side, 1 per side, all at different frequencies. And you are able to play with this. If you now do this uh, separately, or what we even do is, is um, a landau zina suite from here. First, we have this process, then this, then this, and this. Then what we should end up is that in the end, we should have only one atom uh, in the bound state. We stop here, let's say. And we can do this experimentally. So here we have a modern slater with uh, uh, one, two, three, and four atoms per side. We now do this, this uh, sequence of quantum operations, essentially. Uh, at first, we turn all the letter sides with, um, with four atoms into three. So this is why this has become odd now. Then we turn all the ones with three into twos. So this is why this has become dark now, or even. And then we turn twos into ones. Um, now we have a big array of like one atom to that side and we did some finite uh, mm -hmm. And so these are the kind of tricks we can play with, essentially. Uh, we have used this actually to do algorithmic cooling. You can think, well, why start with a modern slater? You can actually so so usually cooling that is done these days is almost evaporative cooling, kind of you just you just have, have um, atoms colliding and the hottest one needs the sample in the stochastic sense. 
and we had to get false condensate, and then you turn that into a superfluid and a lattice, and then you turn that into a modulator. Well, in principle, you could do a modulator differently by hand, right? You just put the right atom numbers on the lattice sides. And indeed, this is what you can do. So if you assume kind of a final sample here, the, the entropy in an atomic modern isolator in the, 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 the limit is in the atom number. So if you start with a sample which has random atom numbers everywhere, we could apply the same sequence. We turn the fours into threes, threes into twos, twos into ones. And so in the end, you have put all the entropy into these atoms in the higher vibrational state. And the atoms in the lower vibrational state, you have one atom everywhere. So, and we call this algorithmic cooling because the idea is you put entropy in a sub in a subsystem, like in a subpart of your system. This is uh, reminiscent to uh, algorithmic cooling in, in, in NMR or so. In NMR, you would then thermalize it with a thermal bath. What we do is we can remove this part of the system by just removing all the atoms to higher vibrational state. And so we are left with one atom per side, and if you then tune the external confinement just to the right way so that we create the Hamiltonian to which this is the ground state, okay, uh, then we can melt this modern slater into a super. So this is a totally different approach, kind of, you start with this kind of algorithmic cooling uh, and go to uh, um, a super uh, fluid. And uh, we thought this would be a huge uh, application kind of for, for our uh, uh, scheme. Mm -hmm. So to what extent can you determine that something's optimal in terms of efficiency or the sort of quickest or, and could you then look for other ways of doing it which would be more efficient or more by whatever method you find. So I'd say this by foot kind of like uh, way is, is very straightforward, and hence I would say optimal, because uh, the, the duration it takes to do the filtering process uh, is just uh, a multiple of interaction and U, and it, it will only take um, um, a few times U to do this whole thing. So I cannot think of a simpler uh, Way, but I haven't really, deep, I haven't thought about that question in a deeper sense, and then we can discuss the, the later a little bit. But kind of actually, you're thinking about it, huh? it would be interesting. So we can, we can do this here. We have this a stochastic uh, Poisson statistics kind of distribution. If you then apply these kind of bottom operations, we end up with a decent mountain insulator. Not perfect, but decent. And if you melt this, uh, you can't do very good time of flight pictures now, I've read in the microscope. But you can clearly see the emergence of superfluid uh, peaks. The width here is limited by the size of the system. So we can clearly see that, uh, that we can get a superfluid from this model later. Yeah, so this is an example of algorithmic cooling, just a different path, kind of different idea. Uh, uh, the, uh, we actually, uh, it turns out, and I'm picture here right now, but it turns out that right now we are still better if you just do it the conventional way, uh, superfluid one insulator. The uh, fidelities here are limited by off resonant, uh, by heating the very deep lattice and things like that. So this could be optimized. <coughs> Luckily, in the case for bosons, it, it, uh, it might not be necessary because our modern insulators, as I said, get 99% fidelity. This corresponds, I forgot the slide here, this corresponds to an entropy of, um, of 0 0.05 kb which is a factor of 10 smaller than what you need for, let's say, long-range and ferromagnetic ordering. <coughs> so the, the entropies are amazing in our minds. I'm actually quite shocked how they are. I never expected that. Um, so, uh, but this method could be interested uh, with fermions, where uh, the timescales might not be as nice. So you could make a band insulator by hand, essentially. This, this could be... Yeah, this could be interesting. Or this could be interesting if you don't have tunneling. You don't need tunneling. You could start with a sample of atoms with larger letter spacing, and then just locally change the atom number to one. And there have been proposals on this a long time ago for different, uh, doing this in different ways. Okay, yeah, but luckily, so what we found is that with the smart insulator, we actually have really low entropy. So, which, which brings me to the next topic, and this is quantum magnetism. One uh, other holy prayer kind of in the, uh, in the community is to do magnetism of the stars. So, to go away from the kind of models where you just consider motion, 
like superfluid to want to consider a change in emotional degrees of freedom, and you want to do magnetism. And uh, yeah, so, so, so let's um, let's go to that. Um, are there more questions about this topic? And let's um, let's focus on that. So ninth, what does that mean? So I I have a question, uh -huh. which is I'm wondering. Uh, have you have you thought about? I'm sure you have thought about putting two different species right in these systems. Mm -hmm. That's a natural thing. Have, have you anything you can share with us at this point about putting two different species and trying to do chemistry and things like that? Mm -hmm. So we haven't. Uh, right. So, so we um, uh, spin states or species. So if you if you use two different spin states and you already have a spinning graph right. on the side, for example, like spin half or so. And this is actually the kind of thing that leads me to quantum magnetism now. You could also think of different species, um, which is very different, because different species, you can't do a pi over two pulse or a pi pulse, right? Like you can't turn uh, a rubidium atom into a potassium atom. This would require a lot of energy. <laughs> uh, so that photon, I want to... I don't want to see that photon. <laughs> or, Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. Um, so, um, uh, so with two different species, uh, inherently you cannot do transitions between them. You always have, uh, uh, but that is interesting. For uh, if you if you mix that, uh, there, there are lots of possibilities. Um, uh, you can treat one species in, this, in the path of the other ones that can create like disorder. The mobile disorder, things like that. Or you could move atoms of one species versus one of the other species. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there. It's it's a huge. Uh, it's a huge. Yeah. Um, there are many, many different things you can do. One. One of the most interesting things, actually. So I won't be talking much about fermionic atoms because I'm kind of running out of time for that. But it, it, imagine you have fermionic atoms in a bath of Bose-Einstein. The fermionic atom would deplete this Bose-Einstein condensate and create a little bump locally. And now a second fermionic atom would feel that bump and would kind of be attracted to that first fermionic atom. Is that reminiscent to anything you know? One fermionic atom gets attracted by another one to some bump in the potential. This is kind of how a normal VCS would come out. In that case, it is a phonon. Like one electron is attracted to another one uh, through the exchange of phonons, but that, that essentially means that the one, for one electron deforms the left around it and that makes it more favorable for another one to also go there. That's a weak attraction. That, and for fermions, well, if you want a superfluid with fermionic atoms, then you need this kind of attraction because essentially fermions have to pair up to uh, uh, to form something that's essentially like a Bose-Einstein condensate or like, like a superfluid, or in this case BCS, this weak attraction. Uh, yeah. So the kind of things that Martin was <coughs> talking about, but in lattices, and so you would think this could happen mediated, for example, via Bose-Einstein condensate of different species. So this would be one example. So if, however, you now use just one atom, and uh, you can change the spin state uh, from, so uh, Akibi said, okay, the atom could either be potassium or, or rubidium, but now let's say it could be rubidium in this hyperfine state versus rubidium in a different hyperfine state. The nice thing is that now we can also put the atom into a superposition. So we can really describe the atom by a quantum spin, as in degree of freedom, uh, and uh, be the quantum spin. And if you then have these spins, uh, well, um, like here, uh, 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 if you know that the little arrows, these spins can interact with each other. And that's kind of what quantum magnetism is about. Uh, quantum spins interacting with one another and then forming different uh, states of matter, essentially, based on that interaction, like magnetism, power magnet, uh, and power magnet. So let's see how we could do this with cold atoms and what the interesting questions are. Um, so um, the three uh, most prominent models 
are, and I'm sure you have heard these names, is the Easing model, XY model, Heisenberg model. Well, it's always the same story, except the dimensionality of, this, of the spin interaction is different. So the basic idea is, you have two spins, and then, you know, the bodies, uh, these matrices, uh, uh, the spin um, um, represented in the Pauli, um, in the, um, in Pauli matrix here, or, or the spin, uh, 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 the spin vector here, and, uh, and then you have the, the spin-spin interaction, which we also call J here, and uh, the spin orientation matters. If you have the easy model, then it's only the Z component of the space that matters. If you have an XY model, then it's X and Y, and so this is different, because here, here the interaction only distinguishes between up and down. So, for example, we could have a ferromagnet, meaning atoms are up, 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 or da, da, down, 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 or enter ferromagnet, up, down, up, down, up, down. XY model is a bit more rich, right? Like, if you have a, a, a ferromagnet here, how big is it now, um, um, now point if you have a direction in the X and Y direction, as opposed to just up and down? Like how can they now arrange? This essentially spins in the plane, x and y. So the spins could all align locally in the same direction, but that direction could be in different directions, essentially x and y. Of course, these are polymeters, so it's a spin projection that uh, comes in the end, but, but you have more Directions essentially the spins can align it, or in the three dimensional, this is the Heisenberg situation where you take the full spin, uh, and the direction looks like this. And then there are all kind of different um, variants of this, and it gets particularly interesting if you let us uh, also get some more. Yeah, so um, um, it's a very rich topic. Um, why is that? So, uh, one interesting property is that you can. Nasty study uh, uh, corner phase transitions here. So the superfluid to mod is one example, but in a way, an even cleaner one, even more simple one, is one in the spin system, for example, from antiferromagnet to uh, a ferromagnet. And I will actually show you one of these transitions in just a minute. Okay. Um, it gets particularly interesting once you put spin frustration into the system. Meaning that, okay, imagine two spins interact antiferromagnetically, okay? Um, so the first, uh, then you put the first two spins in, they want to repel each other. But if you have two times of interaction, which are the same, like the, uh, you have this antiferromagnetic interaction, but here is also an antiferromagnetic interaction, what should the third one do? Like, um, if J1 is dominant, it wants to go, uh, it wants to go spin up here. If J2 is dominant, it wants to go spin down. But how about if they're the same? And the atom really doesn't know what to do. This is called spin frustration. There are many examples uh, of uh, spin frustration. You can get geometrical frustration. Like, um, how could you get geometrical? Uh, how could you get a geometrical frustration? If you just like, how would you arrange three lattice sites in order to get geometrical frustration? Can you imagine that? Yeah, but if you have uh, a triangle, uh, let's assume just a triangle for now, so if you have the first, uh, um, let's say you have a ferromagnetic uh, direction, one for this here, one for this here, but if you now form a triangle and you put the next one here, then the zoom should go up or down. It's, it's in general. And then if you have a letter based on this, uh, yeah, then uh, you get a very interesting uh, state of matter of these uh, frustrated systems. And one of them is a spin liquid, for example. A spin liquid means that, uh, um, it, um, a spin liquid, for example, can mean that um, there, there is no visible order at all, but there's only one uh, unique Around state. Like imagine a lattice like this, 
You don't find any order. Everything looks totally chaotic. But there's a single ground state. Which we could prove by, for example, starting with a ferromagnetic, going adiabatically to that state and going back and still finding a paramagnet. If you can do that, then we know there was only one ground state. But if you don't find any order, this would be a spin lift. Uh, and the reason is because your ground state is a state, uh, for example, this could be an equal superposition of all possible spin orientations. Uh, I mean, that's like totally wild, right? <laughs> like imagine a big lattice. You take all possible orientations, like 10 to the 100 or whatever uh, spin orientations, you, you, you get, and you have an equal amplitude position of all of them. That might be um, your ground state from the spin level. So these are the kind of things uh, we would be interested in studying with other quotatives. Because with quotatives, you could now really then, even if you don't see spin order, you could use the state tomography locally to still extract the correction functions. Okay. We can, um, okay. So, um, how, but, so, uh, spin frustration is a fantastic tool. Uh, and then there's a whole other topic if you have fermionic atoms. Like, here I'm considering pure spin degree of freedom, no motion degree of freedom. Again, I won't have time to really talk about it, but if you have fermionic atoms in the Hubbard model, then you have the, the uh, sorry, if you have fermionic atoms in the lattice, then you realize the fermionic Hubbard model. And it's funny, it's a totally easy model, right? You just have, um, like, have the bosons hopping and on side direction. But theorists, since a long time, try to really uh, hold that model, and it's only possible in crude numeric ways. Uh, so far, there, there's so many open questions, in particular if you then add additional things to that model. Uh, the interesting thing is that it's expected, so what people agree on totally is uh, that it gives rise to antiferromagnetic ordering. And this antiferromagnetic ordering is now a combination of so atoms can still have emotional degree of freedom, and on top of that, there is some magnetic ordering. So this gets even more rich. But then you expect that at even lower temperatures, you get a D wave superfluid, just like in a high temperature superconductor. And there might be connections, there might be interesting connections between. ITC superconductivity and what happens in the simple Hubbard model. So people are very excited studying this with optical lattices because there's a lot to learn essentially. Uh, um, it's not even clear, does the antiferromagnetism, yeah, for example, so like numerical studies have shown that you expect D wave superconductivity, but it is not clear is this, uh, do you expect superconductivity, be, and is this D wave superconductivity mediated? through the antiferromagnetic interaction, or does it compete with the antiferromagnetic interaction? Like, even questions like that are, are typically not well understood. And so, this is the kind of thing we uh, would like to try to study in the future. Okay, so there hasn't been much so far uh, in uh, bulk system of the kettle to try to study itinerant magnetism, but they actually later found that, uh, this, uh, that they must have observed instabilities that seem to be inherent uh, to using, uh, or pretty much that there is no ferromagnetism in, in the system that I consider, which is an interesting result. Uh, and, uh, right. and then Immanuel Bloch has started to, to see some uh, magnetic interaction in, in a double well, uh, and in, in ion traps, we actually some interesting fiber simulations, but in optical lenses, this, this was hard so far. Why, why is that? Well, how, how do we create our magnetic interaction? The, the standard way what people have considered is a uh, super exchange. So, to um, uh, for a super exchange, I mean, this is the same what I was telling you uh, about before that an atom can virtually populate the neighboring lattice site. Okay. And um, uh, in a second order process that scales like j, uh, like j square over u. But if you now have atoms of different spin state, then it can actually probe the spin of the neighboring atoms. So, what, um, why can atoms not see their spin directly, their spin orientation, if they are in two neighboring lattice sites? What would you need in order to do that? If one of them here, one of them here, how could they feel? How could they feel what spin state the other atom is in? How can you get spin spin interaction? What would be the most Direct way in an ideal world. Hmm? 
Yeah, but what, I mean, what if you have two, you have two spins? How can they feel each other? What are ways for them to feel each other in general? Just one interaction. Right. Like, so one is magnetic field. Take the compass needles. How do they feel each other? Well, they want to uh, anti-align, right? Uh, because of the magnetic um, interaction. Uh, and this is the, uh, the same for atoms. Usually the magnetic fields are small for atoms, but uh, there are experiments with chromium, and recently this does prosium actually by Gamlet in uh, Stanford. And there the hope is that this, they can get into a regime, they also place them closer to each other, as you said, where that uh, is the dominant effect. Uh, but it, it's going to be borderline. So that's one way. Uh, what other kind of dipole dipole interaction could be created? So one is magnetic. What other kind of spin-spin interaction as dipole-dipole interaction would you create? Magnetic and electric. Electric, right. So how can you make electric? An atom doesn't have electric dipole moment, right? Not a big one. How could you create an electric dipole moment? Right. So, well, yeah, you could polarize it, you could polarize it in an external field, but that's still very weak. Um, molecules. So that's why David Jin and others are working on dipolar molecules. And they can do this now, they can make ultra cold molecules, actually, amazingly. It's, it's, it's totally mind boggling. They start with the, with the Feshbach molecule and then use a two photon transition to go down by, I don't know how many orders of magnitude in energy to a molecular state, phase coherently. It's, it's still in mind body, but it's possible now in atomic physics there, is that true? But uh, there the goal is electric dapple. So then you could create a gas with strong dapple dapple direction. That is actually that is actually very promising for studying uh, magnetism, that you have a direct electric dapple dapple direction. Uh, in particular, since in the letters you can actually separate, you can keep your molecule field separate so they will be stable and live for a long time. Now, we have only on-site direction. In our case, atoms only feel each other if they are on the same side. So we would have to rely, or typically, what's typically considered is that we have to rely on these second-order processes, where one atom hops to the neighboring lattice side virtually and comes back to the it, will, it, it cannot be allowed to stay there, because then, you're, then you suddenly uh, have to consider other degrees of freedom, name that you now have two atoms here and not here. That's not what we want. You want uh, you want that. You want a modern state, but atoms constantly probe the atoms around them, and so you need uh, these second order processes, and you also need a spin dependent interaction here. But you can do that with cold atoms. So this this is promising. The thing is that the effective spin interaction is now the J exchange um, uh, that scales like t, uh, t, like J square over U. I will actually call this T in a minute. Uh, uh, J square over U, and uh, this is kind of weak. It's a fairly weak interaction, so it's it's not the best uh, regime to work in. Okay. So we actually found that we can play a trick to get an interesting uh, spin system that does not rely on super exchange, where or, uh, that we get an effective spin interaction that's on order of the of the bare J or of the uh, exchange, like on an order of the. Uh, the, the, the interaction directly. <coughs> uh, you the interaction directly. So let me show you how we do this. The model we can study now is the easing model. So as I said, easing, remember, is uh, one, you only have SZ, SZ term. So it's only one, only in one dimension, uh, you have this instant interaction. Okay? And then the, the easing model also has uh, um, the easy model has a transverse field and a longitudinal field. I mean, in general, it has an external field. Okay? So it, you have the anti-ferromagnetic spin-spin interaction yes. and an external field. And here I can plot the phase diagram. So this is the transverse field, the longitudinal field, and the uh, uh, and interaction. So let's think for a moment. What, what do we expect? What do we expect for zero external magnetic field? 
This brings me just an airline. We can inject the magnet up, down, up, down, up, down, just the opposite. Um, but what happens if you then increase your external field? What would the spins want to do? You feel meaning as in something that wants to align the spins in some direction. So ultimately, if your electric field, uh, so if your external field is really large, it will overcome whatever interaction wants to create an anti-paramagnet and force all the spins in the same direction. I should actually draw this a little bit different. Um, it, it, it actually, yeah, that's the visit our phase boundary here. And here the field is in the longitudinal direction, so all the spins point up. Here it's in the transverse direction, so all the spins point to the right. And here it's something in between. Okay. So if you're really far away, then all the spins are just forced into the direction of the external field. So this we said is the Hx. Uh, this is Hz. This is our spin here. Uh, with the uh, z direction and this is the x direction okay, of the of the spin, and then there's also a y direction. Um, I got that thing. Um, so, and right, for very large fields, we have this uh, this paramagnetic ordering. For very small external fields, we get the anti-paramagnetic order, and this would be up, down, up down, and so on. But there's no preference, uh, there's no preference when we start, so we actually have to say plus the opposite. Right? This is say, the same energy, uh, and it will really be the superposition of the two, usually. Let's get some things to okay. And the particular interesting thing is this transition. So the quantum phase transition, this can happen at zero temperature, uh, because the quantum fluctuations can drive that. Essentially, if you come from here, or let's see, if, if you come from here, then the interaction will flip spins in a correlated way until ultimately you develop this kind of order. You can define an order parameter here for the magnetization and uh, find that this is uh, a second order quantum phase transition to go from uh, the, the paramagnetic state. So let's see how we can realize this. Uh, in our system with the uh, algebra methods. Back one slide. Um, so let's let's revisit our items of the optic lattice. Uh, just to add to the confusion, I actually have now replaced the tunnel in J by T, and J exchanged by J. This is kind of a dilemma. Traditionally, in other code atoms, we're using J for tunneling. This comes from uh, the papers and proposals where they propose that the idea is J like a Josephson coupling. Uh, the problem is in the rest of the condensed metal community, tunneling is always called T, which makes sense, T like tunneling, right? It's nice. But the condensed matter, they never study timing. They never study dynamics, so V9, it will travel, if you use T, then we can't distinguish it from time. <laughs> in any case, uh, since it's so common, and since now, uh, what is called J in condensed matter is this spin-spin, uh, or super exchange interaction, and so this is uh, why we now call, uh, the, the J exchange we now call J, and J we call T. So, in the, sec in the last part of my talk, I just have done this, this split because this uh, is what, what many condensed matter people told me to do, except sometimes it, this might cause problems in the future because T is also time. This is good for now. <laughs> okay, so what can atoms do in the lattice? They can tunnel, we said, to the next side, but they can interact. So if you have two atoms on the same side, this will raise the on side interaction on you. Now, uh, this means that if the interaction is dominant, uh, it's not much of a tunneling, then you would get you will get a mod insulator with one atom everywhere uh, because uh, the, the, this is an adaptive to cost uh, too often. Then on that side, you can only do this in virtual processes. What happens if you tilt the lattice? What do you think? What would happen? 
and it's written there. But yeah, I'm just kind of actually tunnel still because if you tilt it, it's still not possible to. If, this is very different from a superfluid. If you have a superfluid, you can immediately call uh, cause a flow, and then you will get Bragg reflection and come back essentially. Uh, in this case, um, uh, if you have modern insulator, yeah, well, it, it's an insulator pretty much. Nothing happens. Uh, but what happens if your tilt is huge? You cannot do this in condensed matter because you can't tilt to the, the U of the uh, of, of a modern insulator, of a fermionic modern insulator, let's say. In that case, you would rip your crystal apart. <laughs> you can do this in cold matter, no problem at all. Uh, what happens if you do this tilt uh, that's equal to the onset direction? What can happen now? What do you think? Could they have this tunnel? Yeah, they can, right? Because this is uh, the same energy now, so it's totally energetically allowed to tunnel here. Why not? Okay. So this atom can tunnel. Each atom can tunnel. This atom can tunnel. This atom can tunnel. Okay. Uh, huh, but what happens if this one has tunneled? Can this still tunnel? It can't now, right? Because this atom is missing now. There is no atom here. So there is no interaction that compensates for the tilt. Okay. Actually, I should also mention, if there was only one atom in the lattice with the same tilt, could that tunnel? It cannot, right? Because it's totally off. Uh, this is lower in energy. But the thing is that uh, we do not have dissipation in the system. So if you have a single atom in a tilted lattice, it cannot tunnel. Because it's not energetically allowed to go there. It has to come back. It can do it virtually, maybe, but it has to come back. But, and the same here. If this atom has already tunneled, this is empty now. So this uh, atom cannot go here. This is not allowed. Okay. This is an interesting system now. Because each atom can tunnel, but, uh, but it can only tunnel one side to the neighboring side. It can also not tunnel further here, right? Because uh, this is also a total energy mismatch here. Um, so each atom can tunnel, but only to the neighboring side. So why do we call this a spin, actually? This maps onto a spin, because you only, each atom has two possible positions. It's like in a double bar. Each atom has two possible positions. We call it a spin. If the atom is at its original location, let's call it spin up. Okay? So here our starting point is spin up. If an atom tunnels over to the neighboring side, uh, it's on the right, let's call it spin down. Okay. So this atom can tunnel, this atom can tunnel, and so on. Well, interestingly, if, you, if it can tunnel, what it would actually naturally like to do is it would like to delocalize over the two, right? It's like a double well. What does it help in a, in a double well do? What's the ground state? <coughs> the atom delocalizing over the two wells. The tunneling? Uh, it prefers to delocalize over the two sides. In the spin language, this corresponds to the tunneling wants to tilt the spin to the xy plane. Interesting. So this is, remember before I said a uh, magnetic field that wants to turn the spin into the x direction? This is actually what the tunneling does. If the tunneling wants to turn the spin into the xy plane, or it wants to create a superposition of the atom of the two sides with the same phase in both sides. So can the uh, lower atom... If this atom was here afterwards, uh, this, while this process was allowed, this atom is now not allowed to be here anymore. So if you look at the net process, if you, if you try to move it away, uh, you would have to get rid of energy. But since there is no dissipation in the system, you cannot get rid of energy. Uh, so that means you cannot have two neighboring spin-down states, actually? Exactly. Yeah, let's see, I think this should pop up in the second here. Yeah, two spin downs for bin. Exactly, very good. So this means you cannot have two neighboring spin down states. Okay? Because if let me go back again. Uh, if this atom has tunneled already, if this spin is already down, this atom cannot tunnel anymore. This spin cannot flip down. So you have a spin constraint now that tells you uh, two neighboring spins cannot point down. And this, of course, that's interesting. So 
can tell you that this must be something interesting because because just think about it. This this atom. Okay, this atom really wants to be localized, right? So this is the superposition of here and here. But if this atom is here, this one can all, uh, and this one also wants to be localized. But if this atom is here, this one can go here. But if this atom is still where it was, this cannot go there. So immediately see how you how entanglement arises in this system. Right? If this atom goes here, this can go here. If it's not, then. but but they both want to delocalize. They both want to be here and there at the same time. <laughs> okay. So you immediately see how that appears here. And before we go through some math, I like the intuitive pictures. Let's see what we expect intuitively to happen here. Okay. So this is yeah, this is the story, this is the mapping, and this is what happens. So we can now vary the tilt continuously. We actually start with the modern solution. So this is the, and then we start tilting more and more and more. And so initially we prepare uh, a state like this, where all the spins are up. So paramagnetic phase, or in the uh, in the particle picture here, you, you just have the original mod state. And now, as it gets more and more allowed to tunnel, the virtual population gets larger and larger. So the ground state in this case is clearly our paramagnet. That if the tilt is less than the critical tilt, so the critical tilt is where this energy difference between neighboring sides equals u, that's the critical tilt. If you tilt less than the critical tilt, then uh, we have this paramagnetic ground state. Okay. What do we get if we tilt more than the critical tilt? Then each atom wants to be at the right. Each spin wants to be down. But as you said, only every second one can be down, right? If this one has uh, moved over, uh, if this one has moved over, this one can't follow, and so on. So, so each atom would want to be on the right side, but only every second one can. Each spin wants to be down, but only every second one can, because of the spin, spin constraint. Okay. And of course, but it doesn't tell you which one, right? So there is a degenerate ground state. Uh, even the odd ones or the even ones can, can be over. So the spin language, the, the ground state, if you tilt more than the critical tilt, is an anti-paramagnetic state. In the, uh, in the position picture here, it's a staggered order. And with this group of degeneracy. And so if we tilt now continuously, well, we could hope that we can do a quantum phase transition from a paramagnet to an anti-paramagnet. Okay. Let's look a bit more formally. So there is a, a nice mapping now between the spin model and the uh, Hubbard model. Um, let's assume that we are at the critical tilt. Right now, it does not cost energy to flip the spin, because it doesn't cost energy for this L to tunnel. This is represented in the spin model here. So let's see what this means. So this is, again, our uh, spin-spin interaction here, J times SC, SC here, uh, and then that spin-spin interaction. Uh, this is our a long, a longitudinal field that wants to point the spins um, up. And this is a transverse uh, the magnetic field that wants to point the spins in the x direction. Okay, and uh, if you just have the, if you at the critical tilt, then it turns out that the anti-ferromagnetic the anti -ferromagnetic interaction is exactly compensated by this offset of the longitudinal field. So we work at the long, at the critical tilt, the longitudinal field is one. This delta is zero. Okay. So if this is one then you can tell that there's no energy cost of flipping a spin. If you flip one spin here, then you gain energy through the anti-ferromagnetic interaction, but you lose energy because this spin is now anti-aligned with your external field. Like, like imagine there's the, the Z component of, the, of an external field points in this way, it wants to point the spin up, spins up. At the critical tilt, there's no energy cost involved in flipping one spin because you gain uh, uh, you gain the anti-ferromagnetic interaction and you lose the interaction due to the external field. The story is different if you try to tilt the second spin. If you try to tilt the second spin, 
then you only gain your anti-ferromagnetic term once, right? Because only it's the same amount of links that is anti-ferromagnetic. Here's one link, here's one link, that's the same as before. One anti-ferromagnetic link, one anti-ferromagnetic link. It's been, if you flip two, you also have two anti-ferromagnetic links. But now you have flipped two spins down, which cost a lot more energies to anti-align two spins with respect to the external field. Okay? So this already has built in this constraint essentially that we realize, or this is this is the way you can think about this. Now if we vary uh, if we now vary the tilt here, this corresponds to tuning our longitudinal field to make larger and smaller. If the longitudinal field here is very large and overwhelming, then we have the paramagnetic state. If the total longitudinal field is uh, is gets smaller, then the anti-ferromagnetic order uh, wins because the anti-ferromagnetic interaction wins and costs the magnetic order. If you had just this, you would actually have a first order classical phase transition. But you also have this tunneling term. As I said before earlier, the fact that the atom wants to tunnel and wants to delocalize over the two sides, see that corresponds to in the spin language, to, it wants to flip the spin into the x direction, orthogonal to this uh, z here, as x. So once you add this uh, tunneling here, we now have a term in the Hamiltonian that does not commute. Okay? And hence, this turns into a quantum phase transition. That's what you need in a quantum phase transition. You have different non commuting terms in the Hamiltonian that you cannot simultaneously. Uh, uh, optimize, that's right. And that's when then the quantum fluctuations are allowing you to, to carry out a quantum phase transition. Okay. Uh, uh, questions? Okay, so this is again the phase diagram. We now understand this, this model here and this mapping. This mapping is valid in the vicinity of this multi critical point. I said if our transverse magnetic field or our tunneling is zero here, then at this point we have a first order classical phase transition. And if you go just infinitesimally to the right here, we have some tunneling, then this turns into a second order quantum phase transition. And this is where this mapping is valid. If you go far away, you have to be careful. If you go far away, there would be excitations. Uh, that lie outside the spin mapping Hilbert subspace. Okay? So the spin mapping might break down because you might suddenly get three atoms on the left side, <laughs> which is not within the spin model. Okay. But in the vicinity of this multi critical point, actually, we can go all the way up and down, but it's not too far to the right here, our tunneling may not be too large, then this mapping is perfect, and we, uh, we have realized a quantum phase transition. Uh, where we start the modulator here, corresponding to a paramagnet, and then we increase the tilt, and this, we go down to anti paramagnet and go up again. And at the key, at the critical point, if all the interesting entanglement, reach, like correlation entanglement, are diverging, reach over the full uh, spin chain, all what comes with these kind of complex transitions in our spin system. Let's see how this looks. Okay. So here we have 1D spin chains, uh, like 1D, this is just a picture of the Martin Slater. 1D, uh, we have tunneling only in 1D, so we, we, we have decoupled 1D chains. And we start with the Martin Slater, and here we have tilted already, so this mapping is now accurate, which means that this is a paramagnet. This is a trick now. With this orbital excitation blockade I showed you earlier, we can actually distinguish Essentially, if it's, if, it's, if it's green, it's spin up. If it's black, it's spin down. Uh, I don't want to, you can ask me what this is like, I'm interested, but essentially, this is the mapping we can create here. Uh, uh, spin up is green, spin down is black. And if we now increase the tilt, you can see how we get a transition to an anti-ferromagnet. Like here, each of the lines, these lines are independent, even if they look correlated, they're not. We have, we have tested that. Uh, each of the line now goes um, like black green, black green, black green, black green, black green, black green, I'm not sure, and green. And uh, yeah, so you can see this kind of interference. So that's experiment? Yeah, that's experiment. Yeah. Wow. So you can see in these 1D chains 
or you go from a paramagnet to an empty paramagnet. And then you can go up and up and, up and down and really watch this one place transition here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like your rules are there can't be two adjacent spin downs is in strictly close um, in this case it is uh, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, this is actually a problem with this mapping technique. This is not 100% accurate. We get about 95% fidelity in this, uh, in this mapping. So if you see two black, uh, we have tested this in a different way now, and this, everything is consistent with wherever you see two black next to each other, it's actually uh, an imperfection in this auto excitation point. Uh, so one of them should actually be bright. Or sometimes you also have an, an atom missing initially. So this ends the spin chain at that point, and we just have that, an, an empty left side, um, which also gives us dark, which is then followed by spin down. That's another possibility. So it's important to make sure this for corner phase transition, they all have to undergo the transition simultaneously. So it, it's important that they, uh, but we can test that in the microscope, and we see they all nicely follow simultaneously as we go from a paramagnet to an um, antiferromagnet, uh, which is important because you want to ensure that the fluctuations really go across the entire chain. Like so. uh, we can even do negative temperature. What's negative temperature? Negative temperature is you start with the highest energy state, and then uh, your excitations are all lower in energy. So what we can do here is, uh, if you go quickly to the other side, we, we, we keep our paramagnet, uh, but we, we now have now made a paramagnet where the ground state of the antiferromagnet. Okay. So this is the highest energy state, lowest energy state. If you prepare this, and then we go back slowly, then uh, we do a transition from a paramagnetic state where the ground state is the antiferromagnet to the antiferromagnetic state where the ground state is the paramagnet. So this is negative temperature, essentially. And you see it looks totally symmetric, which once again shows that we have a very dissipation-free system. You just need to be at an energy extremum. It doesn't need to be a minimum. It can also be a maximum. This is kind of... Mm -hmm. So the state you expect to get after the phase transition, is it a cat state? Uh, is it uh, of of I don't know. We don't really expect it to be a perfect cat state because we have boundary conditions which are, effectively, we have a boundary condition that fixes the spin on one side. Um, one can get rid of that, but also, this is typically what happens in condensed matter, so as long as you make sure that your system size is reasonably large, then uh, it's not really limiting. That. But yeah, that's a, good, that's a good question. And if, let's say you got a cast state after the transition, how would you be able to get it on that? To detect that? That's a good question. You have to do tomography, essentially. So these are things we are interested in doing in the future. There's, if you want to make that, 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 there's a better way. You can actually do the transition not globally everywhere, but side by side, similarly. So we could do pi over 2 pulse in the first one, and then uh, do the transition elsewhere in a serial manner, and that's, that should be much more robust. So that's what we would do. Okay, yeah, so is it in a picture again? So this is a picture you saw. If you zoom in, and you see you get pretty nice uh, antiferromagnets here. Uh, and, and you can see directly if you have, for example, um, um, a dislocation here. You can probe that directly. It will be interesting in the future to do dynamics, for example, what happens if you, if you make an excitation antiferromagnet. This will be expected to propagate. Actually, these dislocations behave as. Uh, Directional charge particles, essentially. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot to do. And it's a, what's nice is that this quantum magnetism actually works on very reasonable energy scales. At, uh, where, because it's not based on super exchange, it's based on the, the, the direct exchange, uh, like because you actually bring your, your spins overlap, essentially, by defining each spin in this kind of like double one. Uh, you can take um, a Fourier transform to really look for uh, the near order parameter. Take the Fourier transform of these rows, and you see, even though it's a finite system, you see a nice, pretty, uh, 
as the behavior here would be expected for the quantum fixed condition. But we haven't really looked into this commutator yet. This is uh, one of the things we're working about on right now. What's nice is you can even extend this to so 2D. You can tilt diagonally, and in 2D you find mappings that again map on a simple spin model. Uh, if you then decorate your lattice, like you take out every fourth lattice side, which is actually easier than it sounds, uh, then you get a system where the quantum expected quantum state is a spin liquid. And so we're quite excited uh, to try things like that in, in, the, in the future. And again, the nice thing is because our basic interaction is first order, uh, these higher order effects leading to like spin liquid and so on should be more easy to reach rather than if you start with the second order uh, spin spin injection in the first place and everything is even higher order. Yeah. So, so this looks pretty promising, so I'm, I'm excited to try things like that someday. And this should then really also address these more exotic states of matter where spin frustration or where measuring entanglement and correlations really tell you about the The new state of matters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess we. I, I guess I should wrap up. Uh, uh, and if we would have had time, I uh, would have told you a bit about quantum information. So there's. Um, uh, let's do a total different things because now this is a picture from my block again. You can flip individual spins in the lattice. Uh, we've also been uh, able to do something very similar. Uh, you can like. Uh, a number of years ago, in 2003, we already created cluster states in optical lattice of spin, spin dependent transport. If you do all kind of these kind of things and combine with the microscope, uh, you should really be able to do like uh, quantum information experiments, like, uh, like a one way quantum computer by reading all lattice sites in a serial way and so on. So I think we have a lot of pretty uh, great tools together to also do uh, quantum information and so uh, um, this will be one interesting direction. But that said, personally, I think actually that these kind of quantum simulation that we now are able to do and that are also starting to become quantitative uh, will probably be the first useful quantum information device, etc. I mean, a general quantum computer will probably take a while until you can really do something useful with it. But what's the most useful thing you would want to do with a quantum computer, anyways? Uh, uh, some people say to to um, uh, uh, um, um, correct codes, I personally am much more interested in using a quantum computer for understanding uh, complex physics, like in, uh, um, like, like um, many of quantum physics that would really um, gain by having a quantum computer. But that we can luckily also do with our quantum simulations very well, which is kind of, you can think of that as a special purpose quantum computer or another quantum computer. So I think we really get to a point where things are starting to become useful, and uh, yeah, so this, this is uh, quite an exciting journey. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I, should, uh, I also really want to mention the people in the lab, the particular experience I was telling you about, the carried out by the Steve Bakker, uh, the grad student, and, and early on by John Gillen, Amy Gang, and, and Simon Tubbing as a postdoc. Working on it, and the current students and postdocs are Eric Tai, um, Mario Chow, Philip Price, and John Simon. Um, and yeah, uh, in particular, the, um, um, most of the work was really spearheaded by the C. Becker and John Simon. Uh, uh, really excellent work, and has extended years, a lot of these ideas came from them, and uh, I would like to thank them very much. Okay, thanks a lot. So, additional questions? Is that if this atom was here afterwards, uh, this, while this process was allowed, this atom is now not allowed to be here anymore. So if you look at the net process, if you, if you try to move it away, uh, you would have to get rid of energy. But since there is no dissipation in the system, you cannot get rid of that energy. Uh, so that means you cannot have two neighboring spin-down states, actually? Exactly. Yeah, let's see, I think this should pop up in just a second. Yeah, two spin downs for bin. Exactly, very good. So this means you cannot have two neighboring spin down states. Okay? Because if, let me go back again. Uh, if this atom has tunneled already, if this spin is already down, 
this atom cannot handle anymore, this spin cannot flip down. So you have a spin constraint now that tells you uh, two neighboring spins cannot fall down. And this, of course, that's interesting. So you can tell me that this must be something interesting because, because just think about it, this, this atom, okay, this atom really wants to be localized, right? So this is the superposition of here and here. But if this atom is here, this one can all, uh, and this one also wants to be localized. But if this atom is here, this one can go here, but if this atom is still where it was, this cannot go there. So you immediately see how you how entanglement arises in this system. Right? If this atom goes here, this can't go here, it's not there. But but they both want to delocalize, they both want to be here and there at the same time. <laughs> okay. So you immediately see how that appears here. And before we go through some math. I like these intuitive pictures. Let's see what we expect intuitively to happen here. Okay. So this is yeah. This is the story. This is the mapping, and this is what happens. So we can now vary the tilt continuously. We actually start with the modern insulator. So this, is the, and then we start tilting more and more and more. And so initially we prepare uh, a state like this, where all the spins are up. So paramagnetic phase, or in the. Uh, in the particle picture here, you, you just have the original mod state. And now, as it gets more and more allowed to tunnel, the virtual population gets larger and larger. So the ground state in this case is clearly our paramagnet. That if the tilt is less than the critical tilt, so the critical tilt is where this energy difference between neighboring sides equals u, that's the critical tilt. If you tilt less than the critical tilt, then uh, we have this paramagnetic ground state. Okay. What do we get if we tilt more than the critical tilt? Then each atom wants to be at the right. Each spin wants to be down. But as you said, only every second one can be down, right? If this one has uh, moved over, uh, if this one has moved over, this one can't follow, and so on. So, so each atom would want to be on the right side, but only every second one can. Each spin wants to be down, but only every second one can, because of this spin, spin constraint. Okay. And of course, but it doesn't tell you which one, right? So there is a degenerate ground state. Uh, even, even the odd ones or the even ones can, can be over. So the spin language, the, the ground state, if you tilt more than the critical tilt, is an anti-paramagnetic state. In the, uh, in the position picture here, it's a staggered order. And with this group of degeneracy. And so if we tilt now continuously, well, we could hope that we can do a quantum phase transition from a paramagnet to an anti-paramagnet. Okay. Let's look a bit more formally. So there is a, a nice mapping now between the spin model and the uh, Hubbard model. Um, let's assume that we are at the critical tilt. Right now, it does not cost energy to flip the spin, because it doesn't cost energy for this L to tunnel. This is represented in the spin model here. So let's see what this means. So this is again our uh, spin-spin interaction here, J times SC, SC here, uh, and then that spin-spin interaction. Uh, this is our a long, a longitudinal field that wants to point the spins um, up. And this is a transverse uh, the magnetic field that wants to point the spins in the x direction. Okay, and uh, if you just have the if you at the critical tilt, then it turns out that the anti the anti-ferromagnetic interaction is exactly compensated by this offset of the longitudinal field. So the verb at the long, at the critical tilt, the longitudinal field is one. This delta is zero. Okay. So if this is one then you can tell that there's no energy cost of flipping a spin. If you flip one spin here, then you gain energy through the anti-ferromagnetic interaction, but you lose energy because this spin is now anti-aligned with your external field. Like, like imagine there's the, the Z component of, the, of an external field points in this way, it wants to point the spin up, spins up. At the critical tilt, there's no energy cost involved in flipping one spin 
because you gain uh, uh, you gain the anti-ferromagnetic interaction and you lose the interaction due to the external field. The story is different if you try to tilt the second spin. If you try to tilt the second spin, then you only gain your anti-ferromagnetic term once, right? Because only it's the same amount of links that is anti-ferromagnetic. Here's one link, here's one link, that's the same as before. One anti-ferromagnetic link, one anti-ferromagnetic link. If you, spin, if you flip two, you also have two anti-ferromagnetic links. But now you have flipped two spins down, which cost a lot more energy is to anti-align two spins with respect to the external field. Okay? So, this already has built in this constraint, essentially, that we realize, or this is, this is the way you can think about this. Now, if we vary, uh, if we now vary the tilt here, this corresponds to tuning our longitudinal field to make larger and smaller. If the longitudinal field here is very large and overwhelming, then we have the paramagnetic state. If the total longitudinal field is, uh, is gets smaller, then the anti-ferromagnetic order uh, wins because the anti-ferromagnetic interaction wins and costs the anti-ferromagnetic order. If you had just this, you would actually have a first order classical phase transition. But you also have this tunneling term. As I said before earlier, the fact that the atom wants to tunnel and wants to delocalize over the two sides, see that corresponds to, in the spin language, to it wants to flip the spin into the x direction, orthogonal to this uh, C here, Fx. So once you add this uh, tunneling here, we now have a term in the Hamiltonian that does not commute. Okay? And hence, this turns into a quantum phase transition. That's what you need in a quantum phase transition. You have different non-commuting terms in the Hamiltonian that you cannot simultaneously uh, uh, optimize, essentially. And that's when then the quantum fluctuations are allowing you to, to carry out a quantum phase transition. Uh, uh, questions? Okay, so this is again the phase diagram. We now understand this, this model here and this mapping. This mapping is valid in the vicinity of this multi critical point. I said if our transverse magnetic field or our tunneling is zero here, then at this point we have a first order classical phase transition. And if you go just infinitesimally to the right here, we have some tunneling, then this turns into a second order quantum phase transition. And this is where this mapping is valid. If you go far away, you have to be careful. If you go far away, there would be excitations uh, that lie outside the spin mapping Hilbert subspace. Okay? So the spin mapping might break down because you might suddenly get three atoms on the left side, <laughs> which is not within the spin model. Okay. But in the vicinity of this multi critical point, actually, we can go all the way up and down, but it's not too far to the right here. Our tunneling may not be too large. Then this mapping is perfect, and we, uh, we have realized a quantum phase transition uh, where we start with the modulator here, corresponding to a paramagnet, and then we increase the tilt, and this, we go down to anti paramagnet and go up again. And at the key, at the critical point, if all the interesting entanglement, reach, like correlation entanglement, are diverging, reach over the full uh, spin chain, all what comes with these kind of quantum phase transitions in our spin system. Let's see how this looks. Okay. So here we have 1D spin chains, uh, like 1D, this is just a picture of the Martin Slater. 1D, uh, we have tunneling only in 1D, so we, we, we have decoupled 1D chains. And we start with the Martin Slater, and here we have tilted already, so this mapping is now accurate, which means that this is a parameter. This is a trick now. With this orbital excitation blockade I showed you earlier, we can actually distinguish Essentially, if it's, if, it's, if it's green, it's spin up. If it's black, it's spin down. Uh, I don't want to, you can ask me what this is like, I'm interested, but essentially, this is the mapping we can create here. Uh, uh, spin up is green, spin down is black. And if we now increase the tilt, you can see how we get a transition to the left magnet. Like here, each of the lines, these lines are independent, even if they look correct, they're not. We have, we have tested that. Uh, each of the line now goes um, like 
black green, black green, black green, black green, black green, black green, I'm not sure, black green. And uh, yeah, so you can see this kind of interference. So that's experiment? Yeah, that's experiment. Yeah. Wow. So you can see in these 1D chains how you go from a paramagnet to an interference. And then we can go up and put, put down and really watch this kind of next transition here. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like your rule that there can't be two adjacent spin downs is in strictly in those um, In this case, it is, uh, that's a very good point. <laughs> um, see. This is actually a problem with this mapping technique. This is not 100% accurate. We get about 95% fidelity in this, uh, in this mapping. So if you see two black, uh, we have tested this in a different way now, and this, everything is consistent with wherever you see two black next to each other, it's actually uh, an imperfection in this auto excitation protein. Uh, so one of them should actually be right. Or sometimes it does have an, an atom missing initially. So this ends the spin chain at that point, and we just have an, an, an empty left side. Um, which also gives us dark, which is then followed by spin down. That's another possibility. Yeah. Okay. So it's important to make sure this for corner phase transition, they all have to undergo the transition simultaneously. So it's, it's important that they, uh, but we can test that in the microscope and we see they all nicely follow simultaneously as we go from a paramagnet to an um, antiferromagnet, uh, which is important because you want to ensure that the fluctuations really go across the entire chain. Uh, we can even do negative temperature. What's negative temperature? Negative temperature is you start with the highest energy state and then uh, your excitations are all lower in energy. So what we can do here is uh, if you go quickly to the other side, we, we, we keep our paramagnet, uh, but we, we now have now made a paramagnet where the ground state of the anti-paramagnet. Okay. So this is the highest energy state, lowest energy state, if you prepare this, and then we go back slowly, then uh, we do a transition from a paramagnetic state where the ground state is the antiferromagnet to the antiferromagnetic state where the ground state is the paramagnet. So this is negative temperature, essentially. And you see it looks totally symmetric, which once again shows that we have a very dissipation-free system. We just need to be at an energy extremum. It doesn't need to be a minimum. It can also be a maximum. Kind of, mm -hmm. So the state you expect to get after the phase transition is it a cat state? Uh, uh, the of of I don't know. We don't really expect it to be a perfect cat state because we have boundary conditions, which are effectively we have a boundary condition that fixes the spin on one side. Um, one can get rid of that. But also, this is typically what happens in condensed matter. So as long as you make sure that your system size is reasonably large, then uh, it's not really limiting. That. But yeah, that's a good that's a good question. And if, let's say you got a cat state after the transition, how would you be able to get it like that? To detect that? To detect that. That's a good question. You would have to do tomography essentially. So these are things we are interested in doing in the future. There's, if you want to make cat states, there's a better way you can actually do. The transition not globally everywhere, but side by side, similarly. So we could do pi over two pulse in the first one, and then uh, do the transition elsewhere in a serial manner, and that that should be much more robust. So that's what we would do in that case. Okay, yeah. So is it another picture again? So this is a picture you saw. If you zoom in, and you see we get pretty nice uh, antiferromagnets here. Uh, and, and you can see directly if you have, for example, um, um, a dislocation here. You can probe that directly. It will be interesting in the future to do dynamics, for example, what happens if you, if you make an excitation and a ferromagnet. This will be expected to propagate. Actually, these dislocations behave as uh, correctional charged particles, essentially. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot to do. And it's a, what's nice is that this quantum magnetism actually works on very reasonable energy scale. Uh, where, because it's not based on super exchange, it's based on the, the, the direct exchange, uh, like because you actually bring your, your spins overlap essentially by defining each spin in this kind of effect, like double one. 
uh, you can take um, a Fourier transform to really look for uh, the near order parameter. Take the Fourier transform of these rows, and you see, even though it's a finite system, you see a nice, pretty uh, uh, steep behavior here, what you expect for a quantum fixed transition. But we haven't really looked at this point table yet. Yeah, this is uh, one of the things we're working on right now. What's nice is you can even extend this to so 2D. You can tilt diagonally, and in 2D you find mappings that again map on a simple spin model. Uh, if you then decorate your lattice, like you take out every fourth lattice side, which is actually easier than it sounds, uh, then you get a system where the quantum expected current state is a spin liquid. And so we're quite excited uh, to try things like that in, in, the, in the future. And again, the nice thing is because our basic interaction is first order, uh, these higher order effects leading to like spin liquid and so on should be more easy to reach rather than if you start with the second order uh, spin spin injection in the first place and everything is even higher order. So, so this looks pretty promising, so I'm, I'm excited to try things like that someday. And this should then really also address these more exotic states of matter where spin frustration or where measuring entanglement and correlations really tell you about the The new state of matters. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I guess we. I, I guess I should wrap up. Uh, uh, and if we would have had time, I uh, would have told you a bit about quantum information. So there's. Um, uh, let's do a total different things because now this is a picture from my blog again. You can flip individual spins in the lattice. Uh, we've also been uh, able to do something very similar. Uh, you can like. Uh, a number of years ago, in 2003, we already created cluster states in optical lattice of spin-dependent transport. If you do all kind of these kind of things and combine with the microscope, uh, you should really be able to do like uh, quantum information experiments, like, uh, like a one-way quantum computer by reading all lattice sites in a serial way and so on. So I think we have a lot of pretty uh, great tools together to also do uh, quantum information and so uh, um, this will be one interesting direction. But that said, personally, I think actually that these kind of quantum simulation that we now are able to do and that are also starting to become quantitative uh, will probably be the first useful quantum information device, essentially. I mean, a general quantum computer will probably take a while until you can really do something useful with it. But what's the most useful thing we would want to do with the quantum computer, anyways? Uh, uh, some people say to to um, uh, uh, um, um, correct codes, I personally am much more interested in using a quantum computer for understanding uh, complex physics, like in, uh, um, like, like um, many more quantum physics that would really um, gain by having a quantum computer. But that we can luckily also do with our quantum simulations very well, which is kind of you can think of that a special purpose quantum computer or analog quantum computer. And so I think we really get to a point where things are starting to become useful. And uh, yeah, so this, this is uh, quite an exciting journey. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I, should, uh, I also really want to mention the people in the lab, in particular the experience I was telling you about, the period out by the scene backer, uh, the grad student, and, and early on with John Gillen, Amy Gang, and Simon Tubbing as a postdoc working on it, and the current students in postdoc are Eric Tai, um, Mara Richau, Philip Price, and John Simon. Um, and yeah, uh, in particular, the, um, um, most of the work was really spearheaded by the C. Becker and John Simon, uh, uh, with really excellent work and has excellent ideas about these ideas came from them. I would like to thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. So, additional questions?